Hello, my name is Andrew Lawton. I am a furniture designer and maker. Today I have Jeremy Brune with me here in my workshop. He's got his camcorder with him and I've told him how I can cut a set of dovetails from ready prepared material in 15 minutes. So here we go, let's get started. Is this Derbyshire elm or...? It is, now that, that, that is witch elm, which is the species of elm which grows well in this area. It hasn't been as badly affected by Dutch elm disease as the common elm, which is now extremely rare. Uh, and the, the wood that that came from actually grew from a, several trees which grew less than a mile away from here in a small wood which um, the National Park Authority was thinning out the wood and I bought several trees from them have them converted into boards and season them. Well, Andrew certainly doesn't hang about. All the, the shoulder lines should always be knife lines because they're precise reference to work to. Pencil lines have a width to them and aren't precise enough. However, when we, act, when we make the joint, it's quite okay to mark out the, the tails with a pencil, provided we, we saw fairly accurately to them, but it's essential then to transfer the, to use the tail as a template for the pins and to transfer that with a knife or scalpel so we've got an accurate, an accurate copy and then to saw just in the waist. We, we must leave the line for the pins. Now that's interesting using dividers to step out the tail positions. Uh, the method I learned at Shoreditch College uh, would be a little quicker I reckon. I notice you're using a, a metalworking engineer's square, Andrew. I find the engineer's tri-squares much more accurate and, and pleasanter to use than the traditional uh, rosewood wooden handled um, square. Aren't they a bit limited in that they're not as long, uh, you know, if you're, you're doing a wide bank of dovetails? I do have a, a much larger version of the same, uh, same yeah. tool, which I would use on a, yeah. uh, on a, on a bigger workpiece. Mm. Well, this is certainly keeping me on my toes. Now I notice, Andrew, as you're sawing the tails, that you're not um, slanting the wood so that you're sawing vertically, but I guess you're doing that for a reason. The reason I was taught to do it that way is simply because it's a lot quicker and one can get into a rhythm of so you're just working, working the whole way across the, the board by doing it that way. You'll notice that I'm using all of the teeth of the saw. I'm using, I'm, rather than just sawing away, using a few teeth in the middle, I'm doing long full strokes, but I'm not putting on any weight, I'm simply using the weight of the saw to do the work. All I'm doing is pushing it back and forward, and controlling it that way, you control the, the movement of the saw.
Mm, a little time lost here, as I reckon Andrew's experienced enough to cut straight to the line. Well, this is the real skill, uh, sawing straight to the line and sawing it so quickly. Well, Andrew, I'm, I'm impressed by the speed of using this coping saw. I'm expecting this blade to snap at um, any moment. Well, it has been no coping work, so it's quite shabby how the thing is. You'll notice as I'm starting off removing the waste with a very narrow chisel. And the reason I do that is because it's much easier to nibble away the wood with a narrow chisel, but it's harder to control. What I want to do is end up with an absolutely straight line on the shoulder line. So after I've removed the bulk of the waste, I'll then use a wider chisel to keep it dead flat.
Now there's the sound of a razor sharp chisel. If we just put a little lead in on the inside, it does two things. It means if the, if the pin is slightly too tight, it doesn't crush the joint and cause the fibres of the, of the wood to, to crumble. And it also gives a space for any excess glue to squeeze into, which could otherwise maybe prevent the shoulders from coming up perfectly. Ah, well, we're at this moment of truth stage now, Andrew. What, what's going through your mind? Well, if anything is going to go wrong, what, what could happen now is the two half pins at the, at the outside of the board, they could, if they're under too, if the joint's too tight, they could burst open and split. That, that's one of the things that could happen now. But hey, presto, it hasn't. But you could also split any of the, you know, the inside dovetails, couldn't you? I mean, the, the wood could split anywhere. In it theory. could, yes, yes. But it would have to be very um, badly tight. So it's all, it's all this crucial question of making it slightly oversized, but how far oversized, isn't it? And it can vary from timber to timber. For instance, if we're using extremely unforgiving wood, such as Wengi or Bubinga, there is absolutely no margin for error there. If the joint is slightly too tight, it won't go together. And of course it should go together first time, which this joint looks as though it is, Andrew. Well, my rule of thumb is if I can, with just normal hand force, get the joint to enter about a quarter of the way, I can be pretty confident with, the, with uh, a hammer and block or with cramps I can pull the joint up. But you're absolutely right, dovetails only fit once. Well, pretty impressive, uh, Andrew. Uh, you certainly um, did it in about 15 minutes, and considering you did that under the pressure of, you know, being filmed, but also, you know, the supreme expert on dovetails looking over your shoulder. Well, I have to say, it's, if that was an actual uh, piece of work, I would probably take a, take a little bit more time over it. No, it was really good. I mean, my only, if I may just say a couple of points, I noticed that you didn't shade waste. And I, I th I, I'm amazed that you soared on the correct side of the line, you didn't slip up, especially under the pressure of being filmed. And the other thing, I mean, it's a small detail, but you used a mallet straight onto the wood rather than um, a hammer and scrap wood, which has more impact and doesn't end the wood. But I mean, the, the, these are kind of nitpicking things. But I've got to say something, haven't yeah, I? Because well, I, I'm so impressed. If it? that was an actual piece of work, there are only three tails there. Mm. If it was a job for a client, then I probably would shade the waste in to mm. avoid uh, cutting the pins off uh, mm. instead of the tails. Uh, and uh, have that again, had that been an actual piece of work, I would have protected the wood 
the, the actual joints w mm. with, a, with a block of wood rather than mm. malleting straight on yeah. to prevent bruising. But I was um, conscious that the clock was ticking away, so I wanted to whack it together. So where would you use a joint like this? A through dovetail like that has, has many applications. It's probably the strongest way that I know of joining two wide, thinnish boards together. So it's useful in all sorts of carcass work, uh, boxes, the backs of drawers. Even sometimes we can make a, uh, the drawer front with a through dovetail and make a decorative element of the, the ends of the mm. tails. So it's a hugely useful um, joint in, in, the, in, for, in high quality furniture making. Great. Well, thank you very much for watching. And I think it demonstrates that you don't just need accuracy in this game. A little bit of speed helps as well. Don't know whether you've got anything to add to that. Well, yes. The first thing, the important thing is be, get accurate first. Don't try and, it's not a race. Don't try and be fast to begin with. The speed mm. will come with practice. Yeah, get, get, get the accuracy first. Less haste, more no, less speed, more haste. Something like uh, that. Yeah. Okay, cut. <laughs> <laughs>